place. So this is the mill okay. room. So what we're doing is taking the barley and cracking it, and then we're gonna send it up over to the mash. Our specialty malts. Okay. So the bulk malt is going to come through an auger, but the specialty malts we dump in by hand. Okay. So we're just going to dump them right in the hopper. Look at this strong guy. So now we're going to dump this in the tank, and as you can see, it's going to go through here and it's going to go out through these tubes and into the next process. So where are we now? So uh, our grain is filling up in here. We okay. want to get this into the mash tun. Before we do that, we're going to fill the bottom of this with water, just so there's water covering the bottom. Okay. Because uh, we're going to add our, our, our acid to reduce the pH, and we're going to add our brewing salts to change so the chemistry So you're actually going to control the water here. Exactly. Okay. Right, so we get it out, we send it out to a lab to get tested, they send us the results, we do a calculation, and we figure out exactly what we want the water to be. Here we go. Too much? Right there, right there. All right, perfect. So that's just going to start filling that. Well, right now, underneath there, there's about maybe 15 gallons or so of dead space. Okay. Um, so I want that water up above the false bottom, so that way the chemicals don't settle into the bottom. I want them mixed in. What's your definition of a good quality beer? Um, there's so many different styles. Um, the quality beer, I would say, would be uh, a clean flavor, um, unless you're going for a fruity flavor. Uh, depends on the beer. Um, but uh, no bacteria, or, or as little bacteria as you can get in there. So a good clean beer, a good clean flavor. Um, you should be able to detect the malt in the flavor. You should be able to detect the hops in the flavor. Um, it depends on what kind of beer you're going for, whether or not you should taste the yeast. Um, and then it should have a, the right carbonation levels so it feels right when you drink it. So you're gonna go ahead and take this and just kind of like spread it around and try not to get it on the rake too much. To so we're right now we're applying the lactic acid. This is gonna help with the pH levels of the water. Pour this in right here. And then this so is? in there is chalk, gypsum, uh, and calcium chloride. Very cool. Now you shake this in. Yep, just shake it around. All right, so uh, right now, as you know, we're in the Whirlpool. So the beer has already been boiled. We've already added the hops. What we're trying to do in the Whirlpool is separate the hops out so that what we're left with is the wort. Um, that's the sugar water and the hop flavorings and, and aromas and we're going to transfer that through a heat exchanger into the fermenters. Now how does it go in, how does it get into a can? We can go look at the machine and I can show you that. Perfect, let's do it. Now I do have another question for you. How do you keep everything so clean? Scrubbing. So 90% of a brewer's job is cleaning. Uh, this is our canning line. It's okay. a wild goose. Um, we have these cans that will feed down. So that line, first of all, from the bright tank will go right here. Okay. So that feeds into the system right here. And this is just a system of valves. Um, so with the cans, we'll come down the line. They'll get, this thing will move up and down. It'll get purged with CO2. Okay. And then it'll move again, and this will get filled. Um, and then goes into the seamer. The seamer just has two big rollers that just, as the can is spinning, it just folds the lid down and then crimps it tight. Wow. Then it pops out a full can. That's cool. So then we have a labeling machine behind it, and we'll just manually take it from the canning line to the labeling. So with this machine. setup, how many beers can you do in an hour? 20 barrels. We typically get about 140 cases out of it, and we wow. get that canned in about two hours. It's around 28 cans per minute. This is a batch of beer that we brewed last week. Okay. Um, and what we're gonna do in the bottom of this cone is yeast that's already done its job and settled down. So we're gonna take that yeast out and move it into the next batch that we're brewing today. All right. Uh, so we use this yeast brink to capture the yeast and then we use this, we force, force pressure on the top to blow it into the new fermenter. And I'll divert down the drain until I see nice yeast coming out and then I'll stop that and collect the nice yeast. So you have to pull it out and okay. then open it that way. And you're gonna go 90 degrees that way. So pull it out. Here we go, peeps. Okay. And now this one is like the other one on the mash tun. You put that lock up and bring it out. So just open it parallel to the line. 
It's like I opened the reactor. So I can see clear beer there. Okay. And I'm not getting yeast yet. So we're gonna kind of control the flow based on this. I'm looking for beer, but I'm, what I, what I, I'm seeing beer, but what I wanna see is kind of this grayish green matter, and that's the trube. Okay. Um, and then eventually it should turn milky white, um, and that would be the, the yeast. All right, so right now I'm here with Ben. Ben is one of the other head brew masters here. What are we doing, Ben? Uh, right now we're weighing out the hops for our first addition into the boil. All right, so what are the hops here? These uh, are what, pellets? Yeah, these are little pellets. It's just the, the best part of the hop. So once they're in the boil, they'll break up, spread out, roll around, uh, and they'll really help the beer get to where it's supposed to be at in terms of flavor. Why pellets? Uh, we use pellets because they use a lot less space and they're more efficient. Okay. Uh, also with pellets, we know exactly how much content is in there in terms of the bittering agents, and we're able to determine how much to put in okay. based on that. So what does added volume weight of hops do to a beer? Uh, the added weight doesn't really do anything, uh, but the weight tells us how much hop to put in based on the alpha acid. Okay. The alpha acid tells us how bitter it's going to be, and we're able to determine, okay, we only need it to be this bitter, we only need to add X amount of hops. In this case, we only need to add about nine or so pounds. Very cool. All right, let's add it. So we got 8.5 pounds right now? Yep. All right. That's all that we need for the first hop addition. All right, so where are we taking this? We're going to take this over to the boil kettle. All right. We're just going to let it sit there, and once we hit the boil, we can add this in. Take us away. All right, so now we're finally at boil, and uh, we're about to put the hops in. So Perfect. I like thinking hops. of the hops, do you want to try to taste some of them? I do want to taste right. some of them. So these are hop pellets. All right. Uh, and so it's just a pelletized form of of the hop cones. Very cool. Um, so you can just find a small one. It's quite bitter. Quite um, bitter. Taste herbal. Uh, and just go ahead and pop that sucker in there and let it let it roll around your tongue a little bit. You really get to taste all the raw ingredients and see what is this flavor that it's adding. Right now, it just tastes very herbal. Um, that's sort of what the hops are, you know. So, yeah. um, but you can imagine it, and, and as you chew it a little bit, it's going to start having like tingling, <laughs> it does. tingling of bitterness on it your tongue. It tastes just like beer. <laughs> <laughs> Highly concentrated IPA, right oh, there. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's strong. I'm going to these back. I'm not going to take seconds. <laughs> You got a beer I can wash it down with? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> How convenient beer. <sighs> this is even worse. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> she got him a twin. <laughs> this is, now this is good. Thank you. <laughs> it doesn't, it's not as concentrated. No. <laughs> but it's good. Proper proportions. Uh, so now that the boil's done, okay. all right, we're going to transfer into the whirlpool. I'm going to leave this lid closed because anything after the boil process has to be sanitized. Okay. So I don't want to open this up and expose it to atmosphere. But basically what's happening is we're going from the hot kettle through pumps and underneath the platform into here on a tangent of the vessel. What that does is just going to whip up the beer um, and then all, just like when you make a whirlpool in the swimming pool, all this stuff sucks to the middle, yeah. and then we can drain off the nice clear wort on the edges. Okay, cool. Uh, so that's what this tank does. It takes about 25 minutes or so to transfer. We let it settle for about 20 minutes, uh, and then from there it goes through the heat exchanger into the fermenters. And so this is, after it hits the third tank, which is this, it's done. Like, it's, so, this, it's, so it's pretty, actually it's pretty much beer until you inject it with the CO2. So what's next is the yeast in the fermenter. So okay. up to this point, it's called wort, okay. W-O-R-T. Um, and it's just sugar water with hops. Um, once you add yeast to it, even though it hasn't fermented anything yet, as soon as the yeast touches it, it's legally beer at that point. Perfect. Here you go, sir. Thanks, Steph. Hey. What are you doing back there? Uh, I started bartending. Really? I didn't see you on the payroll, but that's great. I know, I volunteered. Okay, well, thanks for doing that. Hey, tell you what, I got something to show you. I'm cool. All right, let's, let's go. go. All right, so where are we? So we're actually in the original brewery here. Okay. Okay, so 
So you, you saw the 20 barrel today with uh, Aaron, Yep. right? So today, this is the original two barrel system. So this is all how it started right here. This is here. how we started okay, cool. with a two barrel system. So a two barrel batch equals four kegs. Okay. So just to kind of put it in perspective. So the hot liquor tank is back here. That's the hot water heater basically. And so what we would do is we'd, ma we'd mill grain, pour it into this, to this mash tun, and we would transfer water and sprinkle that on top. And that's our mash tun right there. Okay, and so then- So it's a much smaller version of what you saw earlier today. And then where does that go to? So once, once that mash happens, then that extracts the sugar. It's basically that sugar water, that wort, and we transfer that through the pumps over here to the brew kettle. Okay. So the brew kettle is where we add the hops, the fun stuff. If we're doing peanut butter porter, we add the real peanut butter. If we're doing bacon chipotle, we do the bacon and the chipotle peppers in here. It boils, we add the hops, yada, 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 and we make beer. So the, what we do is we, we put it in a fermenter, we add the yeast, and then we put it in a, in a, a temperature controlled room. Okay. Now we're doing ales here, so this is 64 degrees, this fermentation room. So you see beer inside, that's a joke on the beer Intel inside. thing. Beer inside. Beer inside. So you can see this fermentation happen. You have a lot of yeast activity that happened this high up. That's where the yeast was converting this sugar to alcohol. Okay. So that happens in this room here, the fermentation room. So, so once this is done with the, uh, the when converting it to the sugar to alcohol and the, the activity ceases, then we move this, we transfer it to a bright tank. So on the mini scale here, the two barrel system, a bright tank looks like this. And we're in the cold room, so you can hear the activity going yeah. with the cold. So the bright tank here, as an example, we have, a, we have the brown ale, Abby's Drool in here. It's been pressurized and carbonated overnight. We hook up the carbonation here the, through a stone. It carbonates it, so it's about 18 PSI of carb in there. This is under pressure, so if I let it out, you're going you're gonna to hear that. But that's carbonated beer right there. So the next step for this then is we transfer it to kegs. Okay. Right. So I brought everyone here and I kind of want to learn the backstory and then I want to taste some beer. Sounds like a good so plan. So to get off, how did we used to come up with tin cannon? So Aaron and I used to homebrew together, okay. and uh, you know we brewed for about two years together, and we decided to open the business. So the, the biggest challenge of opening the business was actually finding a name. So we, when we brewed together, we used to drink, and we would get silly, yeah. and uh, we'd start brainstorming. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly. So we start brainstorming names, and then um, you know we thought about the area. We said Gainesville, Haymarket, Bristow, the area. A lot of Civil War heritage, right? Yeah. Now, we're not Civil War buffs or anything like that, but we wanted to kind of do a, an ode to the area. So the, the canon theme kept coming up, uh, but we didn't want to be too serious about it because, we're, again, we're not Civil War like historians or anything like that. Um, so, so we came up with canon, and then we were thinking about other names, and we just couldn't come up with a good one. Well, Aaron's an engineer, as you probably tell when yeah. you were down there earlier today. He's in the uh, know a lot. Yeah, he's, he's a brainiac and I'm, I'm just the mouth. So um, he was drawing out our potential brew system on graph paper and he drew it and it looked like soup cans. And I said, dude, people are gonna call us a soup can brewery. And we laughed about that. And then we, I said, or it's like the old kick the can, it's like the, the tin cans, yeah. right? And so we, we kind of evolved into tin cans and we thought that was funny and we wrote it down. I was like, what about Tin Cannon? And we both laughed and had a couple more beers and, and put it away. And then about two weeks later, we were brewing again. We revisited those names before we were drinking and said, holy crap, that's a great name. So, you ready to taste some beer? Dude, let's do it. All right, so which one do you want to do first? You're going to walk me through this. Uh, let's start out with the blonde. Okay, okay that's so actually my favorite. That's the one I took home with me. Okay, And great. Um, I actually liked it, so let's do it. All right, let's do it. So this blonde stuff was a, uh, so when we were home brewing, we did a Belgian blonde. So a Belgian blonde has a little bit of a different flavor than this does. Um, this, this is actually a Belgian blonde recipe, but we use an American yeast. Okay. So it gives it more of a traditional American flavor. And uh, what you're going to taste is, I, I like to describe it as maybe think about like what Budweiser, Miller, or Coors would taste like if they didn't take some of the barley out of the recipe and substitute 
corn into it. And water. Right, well they put <laughs> corn in it because corn kind of neutralizes the flavor, it neutralizes the color, yeah. um, and kind of makes it kind of, you know, they, they're basically neutralizing it so that everybody would like it. I think that's what I at least read about. So this is what a full flavored beer should taste like, and we call it our entry level craft beer. So okay. when someone comes here and says, I don't drink craft beer, what do you got? What's your lightest that you got? Give them the blonde. So this is the lightest out of them. Correct. Very cool. It has a nice smell. What type of hops are in this and the grains that are used? So we use uh, a traditional two-row base, base grain. Um, we use some, some caramel malt in there, um, which gives it that richness. Um, and so the hops, we just use a bittering hop in it, um, which you're not even going to taste. Very cool. Yeah. All right. So it should have a malty flavor to it, a little sweetness to it. It has a heavy taste, but it doesn't have the heavy drop off in the back of the tongue. Right. Like most of them, it's kind of like, where'd it go? Yeah, that's that, I know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, what is that called? That. It's called uh, macro beer. That's called Budweiser. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to no, slam not, them, man. No, I'm, I talking just... about that. I'm talking about that, when you, when you like this one, right? When so you, it has body, I think is what you're trying to say. It has body, but it doesn't have the fall off in the back of the tongue, you know, right. like. Because it like dissolves and like fizzles yeah, out, Yeah, it's right? really light at the end. Like it's yeah. heavy going in, but it has a lighter ending to it. When you expect to have the same all the way through. Right. Like it sits on the ta ta uh, your taste buds and then just kind of drops off. Yeah, that's like Bud, Bud Miller Coors, they all do that because they have less body. Yeah. And so it like fizzes away like alka seltzer. It's like in the back of your throat and just kind of leaves you with that. I need to drink more to get rid of that flavor that's in my throat now. Very cool. No, I do like this. I have to say this. <laughs> I'm probably... not trying to be mean to those guys at all. I mean, yes, but... you are. It's okay. This is my show. You can be mean. Okay, but I, I, I would drink this over about any day. I would too, actually. My is brother-in-laws it... are from Pennsylvania, and uh, they drink Keystone Light, which is Coors. It's basically Coors Light. And when I go up there, you know, I'll bring craft beer and touch it, um, which is kind of funny. Well, actually, one of my brother-in-laws asked for dark beer, which was cool, and, but the other two won't touch it. All right, so that's great. So now, let's walk through this one. So this is the Twin Cannon Double IPA. So this is actually our best seller. Okay. Um, it started out with our, our love for IPAs, um, but I need to back up for a second and explain how our love for IPAs came. Because as I had mentioned earlier, we didn't like IPAs when we were home brewing. Okay. When I first started home brewing, I didn't like IPAs. But we realized when we were going to open a brewery, we needed to appeal to the IPA crowd, which meant that to me, I needed to know what an IPA tastes like, know what I like or what I don't like about an IPA, what are the ingredients, and et cetera. What makes up the, the characteristics of a certain IPA over a different IPA? Um, so I started drinking a bunch of IPAs, and, and Aaron as well. We would, while we were doing the build out here, you know, we were here doing the construction and stuff, we'd go run over to Giant and do a, a make your own six pack and we'd pick IPAs purposely and we'd sit here and drink IPAs while, you know, while we weren't doing heavy equipment stuff. Yeah, so right, or it wasn't dangerous. machinery. Yeah, correct. Um, All right. So, so we found out that the easier IPA to drink was one that was really malt, you know, they're super hoppy, you know that, which is hoppy, is hoppy is bitter, but there's also bitter from the way you, you build a beer as well. So there's some astringency and some different things in certain IPAs. Um, the hop oils give it a different bitterness and different flavor profile. Um, but the ones that were easiest for me to drink back then were ones that were super malty on the back end, like Dogfish 90 Minute has a really malty finish. So you've got this bitter hop up front, and then you, it kind of whooshes away because the sweetness from the malt comes in. So the sweetness of like the blonde would come and like kind of calm down that bitterness and you'd be like, oh, okay, that's not so bad after all. Give yourself a little bit there. So this is obviously, as I can already see, a little bit darker in color. Yeah, it's, it's more of an amber color. Um, you've got two hops in there. You've got a bittering hop and then you've got the Chinook hop, which is the main hop. This smells more of like a sour than um, before. Well, yeah, what you're getting is the bitterness from the hop. Okay. Okay. And you're, but you're also, you should smell a little bit of that, that fruit aroma, which oh, is, yeah. it's like peachy. It's like a nice, like um, I, apricot. Yeah, it's like an apricot, exactly. So, when you taste it, you're gonna get that bitterness, you're gonna get that apricot flavor, and then it, when it goes down, 
What was missing before on those other beers that you were talking about, you feel that malt just kind of take over and kind of carries it down. Two different beers, and they have like almost a similar profile, but like you said, this one has a lot more of um, a content to it than the sure. other one does. Yeah, you just went from, from first grade to 11th grade right there. You can a lot of times taste like that alcohol flavor. It's like doing a shot of alcohol. You know, I mean, if that's your thing, great, but I didn't want that in the beer. So to me, a lot of those beers were designed where it just, let's see how much alcohol we can make. And you throw sugar into the, into the brew because sugar converts to alcohol and you get a lower body beer with more alcohol-y taste. So we, we really invest a lot of money into the, the grain, we call it the grain bill, the recipe with the amount of malt we put into this beer to offset or basically mask that, that alcohol flavor. So you don't really taste alcohol in this. No, you and don't. And it'll get you in trouble if you're not careful. Very cool. Well, I think I've had a great time. Did you guys check this out? That's sure. great. Well, thank you very much for having yeah. me come in. Thanks I for do coming appreciate out, it. Right. I'm gonna finish my beer. He has to. <laughs> right? So, thank you guys very much.